Okay, so we had kind of two and a half or three very technical lectures in a row. That's life. Uh, it's the part. Of, I mean, part of me doing that is not to beat you into submission, but part of it's to well, part of me. The real reason is that you know this is to be, they're sort of the fundamental ideas you know behind these this this theory of sparse recovery. The other you know sort of reason for doing it is to show that like look you know at the end it's not really you know, that hard. It's just a bunch of little steps, uh, each, each of which uh, uh, can be understood, and each of which is revealing, you know, about uh, uh, some part of the larger structure as well, too. Okay, so now uh, what I want to do, the last, you know, this, this next, uh, uh, next lecture will be much lighter. Uh, we just want to talk, talk to you a little bit about, uh, you know, the low rank recovery. Right, so here the idea is, uh, you know, uh, it's very similar to sparse recovery in that yeah, we're going to have an underdetermined systems of linear equations, and we're going to ask, you know, if we can invert them, and of course we're going to need some structure to be able to do that. Uh, the structure we will use is rather than a vector being sparse, we'll be talking about a matrix, and it's the structure of the matrix is, is that it's a low rank. Right, and so it's another sort of very useful basic model uh, in applied mathematics. And so there's a couple ideas, uh, things you might think about. So let me let's let's go let's let's just give you some examples to, to sort of help you think what's going on. So here's kind of what the, a classical problem or a, a good problem. Uh, it's easy to understand. Uh, called matrix completion. Right. So let's just say I'm interested in a matrix. Right, this is because this is the problem. Here are the entry of the matrix. This is the matrix is X, it's five by five. Right? Uh, that's fine. And for whatever reason, we'll talk about reasons in a second, I only get to see some of the entries. Right? So in this case, I get to see, you know, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. And then so then the question is, is like, you know, is it possible for me to fill in the blanks? Right? When when or when more importantly, like when can I fill in the blanks? Okay, uh, you know, in general, it's impossible, right? It's like if I'm talking about a matrix as being an arbitrary collection of numbers, you know, it's of course, if you know, might say, if, uh, if I don't know this guy, I don't know him, right? It's just pointless, right? But if it's structured, it might be that I can fill these in, right? And it's actually uh, uh, one type of structure you can assume that allows you to be able to do this is if the matrix is low rank, right? And so... Let's just make sure we all know what I talk about when I say a low rank matrix. So the rank of a matrix is the number of linearly independent rows or the number of linear independent columns that it has. Those two quantities happen to be the same for any matrix. Uh, what, what, what does that mean? Uh, in some sense, if I, have, if, I have, if I have a rank of R, that means I can be written, uh, the matrix can be written as a sum of R uh, rank one matrices. Uh, just like something which is S sparse can be written as the sum of S, you know, uh, basis vectors. Uh, and so another way to think about it is if I have a K by N matrix, I can factor that matrix into a matrix which is tall and skinny, and a matrix which is short and fat, right? So this is K by N, but this guy has, uh, you know, still has K rows, but he only has R columns. And this guy has N columns, but he only has R rows. Right, so that's what we mean by this matrix being structured. So why is it structured? I mean, the, the one way you can kind of see that is like, look, you know, in general, a K by N matrix, if it's just an arbitrary collection of numbers, it has K times N sort of degrees of freedom and how I can fill in the entries, if I can fill them in arbitrarily. There's K times N numbers there. I can fill, fill those in. And, you know, if you can think about K by N matrices being in a vector space of dimension K times N, since when I add them, I still get a matrix, etc. Okay, so it's really K times N dimensions. Here, you know, it's actually something uh, 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 less, right? So it's like, well, how many sort of degrees of freedom do I have here? Well, you know, one way you can answer that is, well, it's less than K times N. What it kind of is, is it's kind of like K times R plus R times N. 
So you might like 2 times r uh, uh, times k plus n. It's actually a little bit smaller than that because there might be multiple ways I can write this factorization. Right? If I, I can sort of pointwise these, pointwise multiply these columns by something and then pointwise multiply these rows by the, the inverse of that and I can still get it to work out. So the, the factorization, you know, this factorization isn't necessarily unique, but, uh, uh, but the point is it scales like basically k plus n times r. So this is k times n. If r is small, this is like k plus n, right? Uh, Okay, so much more. So that's what we mean by structure. It, you know, it's, it's sort of many fewer degrees of freedom for specifying a low-rank matrix than for specifying a full-rank matrix. Okay, so, you know, what you can kind of say here is like, look, say if I said this thing was rank one, right, and I, this exact, and I gave you this exact sample of that, so I have a five-by-five five matrix, which is rank one. What does that mean? It means that, like, every single, uh, 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 column is a different linear multiple of, the, of the, all the other columns. Right? And the same thing, every single row is a linear multiple of all the other rows. I can write this as a cross product of two things. So I'm not sure, but I think maybe if I have that restriction, I can figure out just from looking at these entries, right? So I could, you know, divide these two guys, figure out what the sort of difference of these two and these two guys, I could figure out what the difference of these two entries are, etc. There's probably enough here to figure out what the entries in those two vectors have to be. To, to get you back a rank one matrix. Okay, so in general, uh, 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 you know, there's been a lot of work on this particular problem, and you have this kind of uh, uh, answer to this question: is like, is it possible to fill in the blanks? And the the answer is like, okay, you can do it uh, if X is low rank. Uh, you've taken an appropriate number number of samples, and that number of samples scales like the rank times, you know, the uh, k times n, uh, uh, sorry, k plus n, so the two side lengths of the matrix. And the other thing you need, uh, and it's similar to other, other places we've seen for processing, is you need the singular vectors of the matrix to be incoherent. Uh, basically what that means is the matrix is kind of spread out uh, 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 evenly, right? So again, if it's too concentrated in one place, and I don't happen to not sample at that place, I'm going to miss a lot in some sense. You need to, you need to be able to pick up information with every sample. Okay, so that's uh, uh, what it is. So what are some applications? Uh, I mentioned some of these in, in my seminar, but I'll just remind you of them. Uh, one application of uh, 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 both this model being low rank and the, uh, 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 this problem of matrix completion. Uh, so we can start over here. This idea of like a, a Euclidean embed, or say I have like, you know, more to the point, say I just have like a, a large number, so I have n points in a d-dimensional space. So n is maybe large and d is small, right? So maybe I have uh, uh, n sensors in R3, right? So then maybe what I'm interested in for is figuring out what the distance is between every pair of those sensors. Uh, and maybe I, you know, I wanted, what I want is I just can store those in a matrix. So the distance between you know, sensor 1 and sensor 3, I store an entry 1, 3. The distance between sensor 1 and sensor 2, I store an entry 1, 2, etc. Okay, and then it might be that you know, I can only accurately gauge this distance or measure this distance at all between a small number of pairs of these sensors. Right? Uh, and then I can ask, well, can I figure out or kind of triangulate what the distances are between all the different sensors from those small set of observations? And the answer is yes, because this, it turns out that these kinds of pairwise distance matrices, uh, the rank of them is the, uh, rank is the, goes like the ambient dimension plus two. So no matter how big a set of points I have in R3, if I look at a pairwise distance matrix, it's rank five. Okay, so that suggests that, you know, if I really, you know, believe in this idea of matrix completion, I don't need to observe all of the distances between the sensors to know all of them. I can observe it like a relatively small number and then uh, uh, back out what all of them have to be. Okay, that's one uh, application. So another thing, another kind of like uh, a high profile uh, uh, problem that people often talk about, maybe it just falls under the, 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 the general name of like collaborative filtering or uh, uh, recommender systems. Right? And that's the idea of, you know, if you go to a place like Amazon or uh, uh, Netflix, you know, and what these, both these, these uh, 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 websites do is they suggest things, you know, you might like to buy. And so the question is, how do they make those suggestions? Well, what, what one way you can think of this problem 
And this is not exactly how it's done, but the idea like this is kind of what's used for these things. Because you can think of, say, all the users of the systems uh, being kind of indexing rows in a big matrix, and all the products that they're offering is indexing the columns. And then some of the users rate some of the products. So this matrix is sparsely sampled. That's a small uh, number of observations. And then if I want to know, you know, you know, should I watch, you know, Batman Begins on Netflix, it, it, it you know, it looks, it tries to fill in that entry of the matrix. Like Justin Robert, Batman Begins, and you do the matrix completion to kind of figure out what my expected star rating would be for that, uh, for that movie. Okay, so there you go. These are large, complicated problems, but again, it's another way you can kind of, you know, think of them. A uh, 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 simplified version of that is, you know, there's a lot of things I want to know. I only know some of them, but the idea is that, you know, in both these cases, you know, these relations, there are relationships between these entries, and those relationships are really what's being captured by this, this rank structure, this low rank structure. So it just turns out that. You know, in this case, too, being low rank is not a bad model for what's going on. It's sort of a, you know, it's believable if I say there's a small number of factors that sort of affect whether or not I'm going to like a movie, or whether or not I'm going to like some teapot I bought on Amazon or something. Uh, but, you know, that those factors are linear, that starts to be a stretch, but it just, you know, if you actually look at these things and look at the matrix, it is well approximated by a low rank matrix. Okay, so that's, you know, this is one example of you know, now we're not sampling a vector, we're sampling a matrix, right? And in these, this situation, both of these applications, what that matrix is capturing is really not a signal. You can really think of this matrix as capturing relationships between things, right? Another thing you might think of, you know, another uh, 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 a way to think about this learning recovery, or another framework is that, okay, maybe, you know, X isn't a signal, maybe like each row of it is a different signal, and those signals are like closely correlated to one another. Meaning, like, I can basically separate the signals into, say, a skinny mixing matrix times some independent components or something like that. All right, so, like, taking X and writing it like this, you know, that almost looks like an uh, independent components analysis problem. Okay, so uh, that's, 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 that, that's, that's one idea. Okay, so then the question is, like, how do you fill in this missing data? So how do you explicitly take advantage of this, uh, uh, you know, you have an underdetermined system. Here you're underdetermined because you're just, you don't see some things. And then, uh, 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 and then I have some structure, and the structure is that it's low rank. So in this particular case, you know, we have, a, it's sort of similar to the compressed sensing problem that the, the observations we're making, they are linear in the matrix. Right, and what do I, you know, what do I mean by linear? I can, uh, uh, again, if I just sample a matrix, that's a linear operation on that matrix. Uh, I could write that, uh, uh, picking off a sample as an inner product, even as before. Well, I'll show you how to do that in a second. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I can say is like, okay, look, you know, I have a set of observations. I can treat those as linear uh, constraints in an optimization program. And the thing maybe that I minimize, I say, okay, look, I have a set of like sort of feasible matrices, matrices which match my observations. Find me the matrix which has the smallest rank, which matches these observations. Okay, and that's you know that's a good thing to say. Uh, and just like you know our first try at sparse recovery, where we looked to say, find the sparsest vector that explained a, a bunch of samples that we have, that explained a bunch of linear measurements, it was intractable. Same thing with this problem. This problem turned out to be intractable. So. Finding the lowest rank matrix, which obeys some set of linear constraints, again, it's, it's a hard optimization program. There's not a good known algorithm for doing this. Okay, so, much also like the, the, the sparse recovery case, uh, we can uh, 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 relax this problem. Uh, we actually you can relax it in almost what's philosophically the same way. So when we were talking about sparse recovery, we would say, okay, you know, if I want the sparsest vector, which uh, explains the set of linear measurements that I have, uh, instead of minimizing the number of non-zero terms, let me minimize the sum of their magnitudes. Okay, so here, it's going to be almost the same thing. We say, okay, uh, instead of minimizing the rank, where by rank is, you can think of it as the number of non-zero singular values of Z, what I want to minimize is the sum of the singular values of Z. Right, and that actually has a name called the nuclear norm. Uh, and uh, uh, this happens to be a tractable optimization program. 
So it's convex. We know how to compute with it, uh, et cetera. It's an example of what's called a, a semi-definite cone program. Just like you, uh, you know, sparser L1 minimization was an example of a linear program. Okay, so uh, this Z star, this is just the sum of the singular values of Z. It's a, a, it is a norm. Uh, it's, it has its, you have, it has this notation star just because it's the dual norm for the standard operator norm. So just like L1 norm is the dual of L infinity, the biggest singular value is the operator norm of Z. It's dual of that norm is the sum of the singular values of Z. And so, you know, usually in functional analysis, there are dual norms of star. So this just always appeared as a star in the literature. So that's, that's why it's that. It's also called a, a Shatten a Shatten. So a Shatten one norm. So basically, Shatten norms are LP norms on the singular value. So the Shatten two norm is the standard covariance norm. Uh, Shatten infinity is the, the spectral the operator norm. Shatten one is the nuclear norm. Okay, so it's a norm. Uh, we can solve it. And, you know, it's a, a good proxy for the rank uh, in much the same way that L1 is a good proxy for the uh, uh, sparsity. Okay. Uh, this nuclear norm heuristic, uh, it's actually, you know, uh, it's much more recent than uh, 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 this L1 norm. So, like, you know, you're minimizing a sum of magnitudes to, you know, the, the, get something sparse back. I mean, it's an idea that's been a long, around for a long time, kind of robust statistics, and even in, in inverse problems. But the idea of using like this nuclear norm heuristic for loading recovery, uh, this is really, a, you know, sort of mainly, or person sort of mainly responsible for bringing this to the public consciousness is a woman named Marion Fazell, who wrote this, you know, wrote about this all in her PhD thesis about, you know, about 10 years ago. Okay, so, uh, 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 again, it gives us kind of a nice sort of uh, uh, story uh, that we have. Okay, so, uh, you know, if we really want to do this theory, uh, you, can, you can write down this the result. You know, I say here, uh, yes, we can. We can, sorry, I so said yes, we can if it's low rank and single vector are incoherent. We can do it with nuclear norm minimization. What's the actual result? Uh, you know, what you can say is like, look, uh, if I have a matrix of rank R, K by N matrix of rank R, I take uh, random samples of that matrix, right? So that's my kind of observational method. The number of samples that I need looks like the rank times K plus N. So that's kind of like the intrinsic number of degrees of freedom. Uh, there's a log penalty just for standard reasons. There's also this idea of the coherence parameter. And now we're in this coherence. What it's measuring is not... Uh, it's, it, well, it's basically measuring like how spread out the singular vectors are. So U and V are the singular vectors of the matrix X that you're, you're sampling. Right? So essentially what this condition says is if you want U to be small, uh, U and V have to be spread out uh, uh, more or less equally throughout the rows. That's, that's, that's really what the, the technical condition says. And there's sort of three things you need to happen. But that, that, that's what it says. Okay, so that's, you know, that what you kind of know in, in theory. Uh, why do you need incoherence? Like, here are two rank one uh, matrices, right? This guy's rank one. It's just a unit vector across itself. Here's a unit vector across of the vector of all ones. You know, if I sample, this guy's rank one, if I, if I don't know, you know, to, to look here, if I just start sampling, I'm never going to see anything. Right? So it's, you kind of need these things to spread out. And even like this guy, I sample down here, maybe every once in a while I hit that thing, but like, you know, you need, a, uh, you need things to be spread out for this, this idea of sampling to work. Okay. So that's kind of the matrix completion. That's one thing you know. Uh, more generally, right, so uh, uh, you can think about, so any types of linear measurements of a, uh, 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 of a matrix. Right, and so again, like, what do we mean? We can talk about linear measurement in almost exactly the same way we talk about it in a, uh, uh, in the vector case. Right, so in a vector case, it was kind of like, you know, I would talk about like y m is the inner product between x and some vector phi. Right, and this was, of course, the sum of the entries, you know, phi uh, multiplied together between phi and x. Okay, so it's exactly the same thing when I talk about taking uh, 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 linear measurements of a matrix. All right, so if I have a matrix X, 
right? I can think of, uh, yeah, so, so let's just say it's x11, x12, x13, x21, x22, x23, x24, x25, so what do I mean by uh, like a, a you know a, a, a sort of linear observation of entries of x? I just mean a linear, different linear combination of its entries. So I might say like y one, right, is say three x one one uh, minus four x one three plus five x three three, right? So that's you know all that is is. Just multiplying these guys by different numbers and adding them up. Okay, so that's all it means to be a linear observation. How can I write it as an inner product? Right? Well, you can do, do almost exactly the same thing. So what I can say is like, you know, in this case, I can say y1, this is the inner product of x with the matrix 3, 0, minus 4, 0, 0, 5, 0, 0, 0, like this. This is in the Frobenian, uh, quote unquote, Frobenius inner product, right? So just like you know, I can write a standard inner product by pointwise multiplying two vectors and adding all the entries. You can write a, a, a measurement of a matrix by pointwise multiplying this matrix with another matrix, right? And in this case, the matrix just contains these coefficients, and then adding everything up. And the one, the way you can sort of simplify this, this action of pointwise multiplying two matrices and adding everything up. If I call this guy, you know, a sub 1, this is just equal to the trace of a1 transpose x. So if I have two matrices, I take the, con the transpose of this, multiply it by other, and sum the diagonal. That's exactly the same operation as taking the two matrices, pointwise multiplying up, and then summing up all the entries of the result. And so this is exactly equal to the sum over k n, a1 of k n, x of k n. So it's, it's a, it really is linear measurements of exactly the same time. Right? So we can write this in a product. Uh, it would be exactly the same as if I took the matrices and stretched them out as vectors and used the standard inner product, you know, pointwise multiplying things and adding them up. It's just a, a nice, compact way to write it. So you often see like a, a linear measurement being the trace of a1 transpose x, et cetera. Okay, so, you know, this is the picture you should have in your mind. All right, so, you know, just we, we, we had this idea of, you know, being able to fill in the missing entries in a matrix by sampling by sub, when, you know, from a set of subsamples. Uh, we can just think of more general systems of linear equations, right? So, again, uh, you know, if I have a, a, a matrix that's K by N, and it takes k times n of these linear observations, and those linear observations are all linearly independent from one another, I can recover the matrix by, you know, linear, solving least squared. If I take fewer than k times n of these linear measurements, right, I, you know, the solution is not unique, just as it is in the vector case, and I need some structure to help me recover. So in this case, we're going to use the structure as being the rank. So really, this measurement aspect to it, there's nothing special about matrices here. It's just linear combination of the entries, just like with the vector. We really are just treating matrices like vectors uh, for this part of it. Now, this, this idea of the rank being a good model, you know, that is, you know, very dependent on the fact that we've ordered these things uh, uh, in a certain way, talking about linearly independent rows and columns. So the rank structure becomes more apparent when the entries are sorted as a matrix. But the actual measuring process, you know, matters not at all whether or not you're a matrix. It's exactly the same. Okay. Uh, so, you know, we, what we can talk about, uh, again, is like if we, if we want to sort of have a system of, of uh, M equations and K and unknowns, we can again write, you know, we can sort of talk about uh, uh, these measurements that we make. We say, okay, look, we have a vector in Rm, and it's equal to some linear operator acting on X0. Right, so this operator script A takes a k by n matrix, or a vector in kn, if you will, and returns m uh, measurements, m linear combinations. Okay, I'll tell you what this is not in general. This is not some matrix applied to the right, uh, left of x. It's not some matrix applied to the right of x. And it's not even some matrix applied to the left or the right of x. It can be those things. But there are more general types of linear operators than, than just doing those. Okay, so 
uh, uh, you know, but again, if you stretch x out as a vector, you know, you could rewrite this at, uh, and you stretch out all these kind of measurement matrices also as vectors. You can just stack those up as rows in a super matrix, if you will, that is measuring the super vector, which is a rasterized version of x naught. Okay, so all of this is just to say, you know, it's, it's a very, very natural way to extend this idea of generalized sampling of vectors to generalized sampling of matrices. Really, there's not much that changes uh, uh, almost at all. Okay, so, uh, you know, we draw this picture of the L1 ball, and it's simplified in R2 with a little diamond, sometimes I draw it in 3D. Uh, and we say it kind of works because, you know, the vectors are at these singular points. Uh, here's the, the, the comparable oversimplified picture for low rank. So if I have a 2 by 2 uh, symmetric matrix, x, y, z, here's the space of all uh, rank 1 uh, uh, matrices are these, uh, uh, that, that have this form. Uh, that also, for Vinnius norm equal to 1, uh, it's, it's these red circles. So this is kind of like a sparse vector. And then this convex hull is, this is this, this nuclear norm is less than or equal to 1. So again, it's singular right here. So there's this sharp edge at the, at the around this, this. This it's like a, you know, it's like a, it's like a can of corn, right? And so you have these these edges, you know, that if you have a flat plane, it's going to tend to bump in like this flat edge, it's like this thing, kind of, right? But it's sort of singular in a different way. Like at the end of the day, the geometry is much different than than the L1 ball. So it still has this property of like the class of things that we're interested in kind of lives on the edge. Of this, uh, of this convex structure, All right? So if you have like, you know, when we draw diamonds for, for L1, this is the type of thing you can imagine drawing for, for uh, 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 the nuclear norm. So that's, that, 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 that gives you an idea. So all these little pictures we draw, you can replace it with this. So again, this would be like, what does the structure look like uh, in RNK? You know, I have a linear hyperplane, which tells me the results, and I can think of minimizing the nuclear norm is blowing up a structure like this till it bumps into my hyperplane of constraints. Okay, uh, that's good. Uh, what can you say? So basically, you can you have almost exactly the same story uh, on one hand as you do in the sparse recovery sets. You can say, uh, you know, what do I need to be able to recover a rank R matrix through a linear operator? Well, I need that that linear operator keeps all rank R matrices separated from one another, right? Which basically means uh, if I look at all rank 2 R matrices, in some sense, the energy should be, be preserved. So if I look at the sum of the squares of the measurements, that should be comparable to the sum of the squares of the entries of the matrix. It's exactly the same condition, but instead of talking about sparse vectors, you're talking about low rank matrices. So it's kind of like a matrix-restricted optometry property or something. Okay, uh, and then, uh, uh, then the question is, look, you know, uh, uh, how do we recover it? Again, you, you set up a, a feasibility condition. You look over all matrices X that obey your, your measurements, your linear constraints, and you find the one with smallest nuclear. Right, and then, you know, how do you prove this? So how do I prove if I have this, I should this? Well, actually, you know, you know, when we did this yesterday for L1, we had this idea of descent cone, and null space. All those things are uh, like all, almost exactly the same uh, uh, when you do this, this proof. Now, how, you know, this, these geometrical conditions on how the descent vectors are constrained, those are, of course, different because this is a different geometrical structure than this, this L1 ball. But, I mean, it's like, a, a, you know, it's the, sort of the tenor of the argument is, is very similar. Okay. So again, it's like, you know, we, we're not going to prove this, but it's, it's, it's the something which, you know, now if you've under, understood what went on in the last past two days in this course, you could go take a look at these papers and be very comfortable with what is being said there. Okay, uh, it's also stable uh, in the presence of noise and robust for matrices that are popular rank for in exactly the same way, you know, that L1 recovery is is uh, 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 robust for vectors which are only approximately sparse and stable when I add noise to it. Uh, and then, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, okay, what kind of uh, uh, linear operators uh, embed space of rank 2R matrices? So you can actually make this say exactly, the, almost exactly the same as what we did uh, uh, in the last lecture. You can extend to uh, doing rank R matrices. 
right? So what you can say is like, okay, look, you know, if A's are a random linear projection, so that means that that you know I take an inner product against M k by n matrices, and each of these k by n matrices has iid Gaussian random uh, uh, noise in it. Then you can say that, like you know, for this we actually proved exactly in the last lecture that then for any fixed matrix X, the probability that it exceeds its Frobenius norm by more than a factor of delta is e to the minus. If the constant is even the same, delta squared over eight times m. Uh, and that, you know, this part doesn't change because remember when we when we talked in the last hour, you know, we talked about a, a concentration for a fixed vector. Well, didn't, we didn't really talk anything about that vector being sparse or anything. It was just an arbitrary vector. So this is just you know exactly the same, but for matrices. But again, this, 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 we can just treat these things exactly like vectors. So then, you know, what you need to change to show that uh, 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 random matrices give you efficient bending is, you know, we have this argument about, like, uh, looking at all 2s sparse vectors, so we had to discretize this 2s dimension, subspace of dimension 2s, and take a union bound. You know, here what's kind of different is you do still have a union of subspaces, but it's like a continuum union. Because, like, you know, if you're considering the sort of space of rank R matrices, they can have any support where support means left and right singular vectors, so the support lies on a continuum, and then any sort of array of singular values on that support. So it really is a continuum of subspaces as well, as you know, an infinite number of things within those subspaces. But regardless, you know, you play the same trick where you discretize this continuum, you play the same trick of going to the approximation theory literature and pulling out good estimates for the size of those nets. At the end of the day, what you pull out is you know, when the number of measurements you make is on the order of the rank times k plus n, this, uh, uh, you have this quote-unquote matrix, restricted matrix isometry property. So half of this we already did. We did in the earlier part. You really just have to do the geometric part. And this, the geometric part is equally, you know, uh, straightforward. Okay. Uh, so, again, remember that, like, r, r times k plus n uh, it's, that's about as, you know, uh, as good as you can hope for, uh, in the sense that that's really is the number of degrees of freedom for uh, uh, linear degrees of freedom for a, a rank R matrix anyway, a K by N rank R matrix anyway. So just like, you know, uh, uh, random projections are sort of efficient uh, embedders of sparse signals, they're also efficient embedders of uh, 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 low rank matrices. Okay. So that's 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 low rank recovery. So the, uh, you know all we're all, again this is just more from the mathematical side. Uh, what do we know? Uh, uh, what do we don't know? We we have these two examples of taking samples of the entries of a matrix and taking a random linear projection. There are other examples of structured linear projections of low rank matrices that have you know complicated mathematics that go with them in their own kind of sets of applications. Uh, this is just to give you a flavor for, you know, what the kind of state of the art or what the main results are in this field. Okay, so that's good. That's kind of what we know about recovering low-rank matrices or just a small bit about what we know about recovering low-rank matrices uh, 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 from underdetermined sets of uh, linear equations. I wanted to talk a little bit now at the end of this hour about uh, this, this, this sort of new... It's being called a lifting trick, or kind of a new trick for saying recasting uh, nonlinear systems of equations, in particular bilinear systems of equations or quadratic systems of equations, into low rank recovery problems. Right? And it's actually really simple how this works, and I think it's extremely powerful. So we're doing, you know, we're written a couple papers about this in our group already, and we, we're really excited about some of the applications this might have in, uh, in the field of signal processing. But at the end of the day, you know, given what we know about low rank recovery, you know, this, this trick becomes simple at the end of the day. So here's the scoop. You know, here's what we know. So let's say that instead of a set of linear equations, uh, which I know a lot about, let's say I have a set of bilinear equations. So what does bilinear mean? It means I have Two things that I don't know multiplied by each other inside these equations. So instead of saying like 6u1, you know, uh, minus 6v3 or something like that, I have u1 times v2, and I don't know what those are. Okay, 
So, you know, if you have that, you don't have like, a, you know, nice hyperplanes intersecting each other. You get this, you know, I like to call it bilinear spaghetti. You get all kinds of curves and maybe they meet, maybe they don't. Maybe they meet at multiple points. Maybe they don't meet at all. It's, it's a much more complicated uh, uh, scenario. Okay. So we don't have anywhere near the same framework for solving, you know, bilinear equations as we have for solving linear equations. It just doesn't, it doesn't exist. But here's the here's kind of a new framework, uh, and, and, and again, it's simple. So you have this this observation that okay, look, if I have a, an equation like this, of course, okay, this is bilinear in U and V because I don't know any of the entries of U or any of the entries of V, but it's actually linear in U cross V. So if I just look at the matrix U V transpose, like what is that matrix except the collection of all products of entries between uh, entries of U and entries of V, right? And so a bilinear uh, equality constraint is exactly a linear constraint on this matrix. So this, you know, this uh, 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 say this bilinear equation U one V one plus five U one V two plus seven U two V two minus twelve. I could say, okay, that's like taking the inner product of this rank one matrix with another matrix which has a one here, a five here, and a seven here, and that inner product is equal to minus twelve. And that's you know, so that's that's the trick. It's a, it's a bilinear equation, but it's a linear equation in this cross product of U V T. And okay, you know, U V T is a K by N matrix, but it's a matrix which has special structure. What is that special structure? Well, it's rank one. And you know, when we have linear now that we have this whole idea of low rank recovery, we have linear equations of a rank one uh, you know, or low rank matrix, we know exactly what to do. You know, we know effective ways of solving them already. And, you know, use nuclear norm minimization. Okay, uh, so one way you can kind of interpret these, these, this, these results for some compressive low rank recovery uh, so, you know, if I had, let's say I have a random projection of a rank one matrix, uh, what do I know? I know I can recover that rank one matrix in something like K plus N uh, 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 measurements. Uh, so uh, what I could say is like, look, you know, uh, uh, what that means is it means kind of like generic quadratic, or in this case bilinear systems, which should be some constant times K plus N and K plus N unknowns they can be uh, 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 figured out or solved using nuclear norm minimization, you know, if they have solutions, right? And that's, uh, that, that's, uh, that's an interesting thing. It says, like, basically, okay, I, know I need them to be slightly overdetermined uh, and generic. Like, most systems of equations will work in some sense, is what that's saying, if they do have a, 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 unique, if they do have a unique solution. <clears throat> okay. So that's, you know, that's interesting. That's just, you know, immediate result. I mean, we didn't do anything here except make this kind of, you know, in hindsight, obvious connection and uh, pull out, you know, what we know from the, uh, from the literature from recovering a low rank matrix. There's, there's really nothing else there. Okay, so uh, you can say the same thing like bilinear, also like quadratic. So if you just have a single vector, like, so that's like taking a, if I have like B1 squared and B1, B3, so basically entries of the same vector multiplied by each other, uh, that's, you know, again, that's, it's, it's, it's exactly the same thing, but now it's, just, it's even better because now the rank one matrix you're sensing is symmetric. That's the only difference. So any quadratic system of equations can be written in these B1 to Vn can be written as a linear combination of this rank one symmetric matrix. Okay, so that's how you do like, and that's kind of the, the, the a cool idea, is you have systems of bilinear or quadratic equations, and you can recast them as a, a, a linear equations with a rank constraint. So it's good, you know, and we're getting like a fresh look at solving bilinear equations, but it's not that new an idea either, because like there's been sort of other fields where this idea of, you know, taking problems like this and recasting them as semi definite programs is kind of standard. So doing things like you know network flow analysis or stability analysis or filter or antenna array design, uh, relaxing quad quadratic equality constraints with the SDPs, uh, this was kind of a known trick, right? It just we didn't we didn't just it just didn't have this aspect of like knowing how knowing when low rank recovery works and guaranteeing solutions. Are. So one interesting result in the literature. I'll talk about another interesting result in a second. But one is like. Uh, 
you know, it's called, the, it's a result of what's called phase retrieval. But really the idea is like, look, what I get to observe is I observe inner products of an unknown vector x against, uh, uh, no, against a known vector, al, but I don't get to see the inner product. All I get to see is the magnitude of the inner product, or the magnitude squared. Right, so it's a nonlinear measurement of, uh, of, of this vector x. Uh, you know, and that stuff like this comes up all the time when you're doing like uh, a coherent imaging where you can only ma measure like the magnitudes of, of a light field rather than its magnitude in phase, uh, uh, et cetera. So it comes up, actually this problem comes up a lot in, in, in just imaging in general. So what they, what, they, what they could show is to say, okay, look, you know, problems like this, I can rewrite this as a uh, basically linear measurement on XX transpose. In fact, it's the inner product of AL, AL transpose, the Frobenius inner product of AL, AL transpose with XX transpose. So I have a series of, uh, of uh, uh, measurements of a Rankine matrix. And what they could say is like, if these AL are generic, so random, uh, random vectors, uh, uh, when L is on the order of N, I can recover x by solving a, a, a low rank recovery problem, right, by solving s to p. And so that's nice. It gives you an insult. It's like, I only can see the magnitude of things. What can I recover? OK, so that, uh, that's, that's one result. So here's another, we, here's another result, kind of in the area of blind decompositions. Let me just motivate this with kind of a stylized communications problem. Right, so I want to communicate from one point to the next. Uh, when we, a lot of times when we do so without a wire, what happens is, you know, I send my message, there's a direct path to the receiver, and then maybe there's some multipath, right? So this, here's this guy trying to communicate underwater, one guy gets another thing, this guy bounces off the sand, this guy bounces off the surface, then the sand, and this guy just bounces off the surface. But the point is, what the receiver sees, is he doesn't see just the message, he sees the message uh, overlapping copies of the message with itself. Right, where maybe where these reflections happen, it picks up some kind of amplitude and phase change, too. So really what you're seeing is you're seeing a convolution of the original message uh, with maybe an unknown channel, right? Or with convolution of the message with the channel, and if you don't know it, you know, you have this problem of what's called blinding convolution. You don't know the channel. So of course don't know the message, because that's what's being communicated. How do I undo these two things? And so you see it underwater. I mean, you see it obviously often when you're on a cell phone driving, bouncing off buildings while you're communicating with the base station, etc. Okay, so that's you know what we want to do is we say, okay, if we have channels like this, how uh, how maybe can we estimate and compensate for them, even if we don't know them? It's got it's, a, it's a, again it's like a a problem which comes up all over in signal processing communications. Okay, so. Here's, uh, uh, one, what, here's what we'll think about it, and this will kind of make, make it clear what our structures are. So we have some message M, right, and we encode it. So we, that means we kind of protect it in some sense against errors. Right? And so the way we do this protection is we take M, and this is kind of what does go on in the actual coder, and we embed it into a longer matrix RL, a longer vector RL. Right? And the way we do that embedding is literally, so we apply a code, a channel code to M, it just makes it longer. So this gives it redundancy. So this is, a, say, an L vector, uh, but it's not an arbitrary L vector. It's an L vector which is in the, uh, the column space of this codebook C. Right? And so the idea is like both the transmitter and the receiver know C. So of course, I don't, the, of course the, the receiver doesn't know the message M, but it does know that, that what I get should be in this, the, uh, the column space of C, right? the codebook C. Okay, so then I go out into the world, and then this P, this encoded message goes out into the world. It gets convolved with an a, a unknown channel. And we'll say, you know, you can think of the channel, uh, what we'll say is, let's say, like, we don't know anything about the channel except it only lasts for a small amount of time. So it gets convolved with a short sequence, a sequence we know is short, but we don't know what the sort of what path values are. We don't know what the impulse response is of this, just that it's short. Okay, and then the decoder's job is to take y uh, and figure out what m and the channel were at the same time, right? And so, what do you? What, well, how? Well, of course, you know it's impossible to structure. But what's the structure we have? We know that y is a convolution of two things: convolution of p with h. We have structure on p because it's a superposition of columns of c. It's the subspace structure. We know that p lives in a certain subspace. Uh, we have structure on the channel just because we're saying it's short. You know, it's shorter than the length of the message in some sense. 
So then you can ask, okay, like, you know, we'll play this game, like, when does this work? Or more, you know, another question you could ask, and sort of when does it work, is like, like, what kind of coding redundancy do I need? How long do I need? How many sort of extra entries do I have to protect this with to protect against a filter of length k? All right, so how, if I want to protect against k bounces, uh, how, what kind of coding redundancy do I need? Okay, so that's, that's the idea. Uh, so, you know, you're uh, observing h times c times m. I don't know m. I, I know ch is tuplets, but I don't know what, it, what its character looks like. Uh, so really what you, which, how you can kind of uh, 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 view this is I can view is like, okay, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing y. I'm seeing, uh, you know, if I h0, h1 through hk minus 1, if that's like the first row of h, what I'm seeing is cm times h0, cm shifted by 1 times h1, you know, plus cm shifted by k minus 1 times h of k minus 1. So there's n's and h's all over here. So this is, again, one of these bilinear systems of equations. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, we're going to deploy this low rank structure to be able to solve it. Okay, so what do you get when you actually write this out? So this is like, uh, you know, at the end of the day, what I can write, the, write this at is I can say, okay, look, another model for what I'm measuring is I just say, okay, uh, let me look at the first entry in my code book. And I form a tuple, uh, sorry, the first column in my code book C, and I just form a tuple matrix from it. Right? So that's saying if like there's only one, you know, if only the first entry in the message were non zero, I'd be seeing this first column of the code book come out, and that would be convolved with my channel. So that's the same. Convolve the first column of your code book with channel. But if I have multiple entries in my message, right? So if M is non-zero and more than it's just first term, what I'm really seeing is different uh, uh, code books of the column convolved with the same h, but multiplied by different m's. Right? And so again, what we're doing here is we're saying, OK, look, I, let me take this matrix. I can now see that this is a, a, a k by n rank 1 matrix that's just been rasterized. And I'm applying this type of projection to it. Right? And if I make the code book random, what is this? This is like a concatenation of random tuplets matrices. Right, so I don't have like a IID random projection. I have a structured random projection because the structure is coming from the fact that these things are being convolved with one another. Uh, and it's being applied to my rank one matrix. So that's what we need. We know that you know, low rank recovery is good. We don't necessarily know how good it is for, for, for random projections which look like this. So that's kind of what we have to figure out. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, again, we, we're talking about you can write... Uh, this, these linear observations, so what I'm seeing as a linear operator acting on the message across the length k channel response. Uh, and again, it's how you write it is like, well, I mean, you can see it. So if I if you're rewrite things in the Fourier domain, it's kind of, no, no, it should be a surprise that the things you need to write down. You know, what you can write is kind of like a, a function of the Fourier transfer of your code book and the Fourier transform of your channel, things multiply together, which is giving you the bilinear. So this is the, basically the fun form of the measurements that you see. Okay, so well, when you simulate this thing, it's actually kind of cool what you see. So here's for something that's length uh, 2 to the 15, uh, which is like, I guess, like 32,000. And so you, what you can see is like this white is like values of K and N for which this low rank recovery works. So that you can kind of think of this as the length of the message and this is the length of the channel, and your this is the length of the code you're using. So if I have a 30, you know, if I encode a 8,000 length 8,000, I'm oh, sorry, a length 8,000 vector to by a, a 40,000 to sorry 32,000. So this is by a factor of four. Uh, then basically I can protect against 4,000 taps in my in my channel reliably, right? And in general, like if you have a message of length n and you have k taps. Kind of the, the redundancy you need, the length you need to make your code, looks like three times n plus k. Okay, and then you can, you know, prove theorem. Uh, of course, you know, what this, what it's going to rely on at the end of the day, you still have a coherence condition. And what the coherence boils down to at this point is just kind of like the, uh, the maximum value of the Fourier transform of your channel. Basically, you want the channel, if it's uninorm, you want it to kind of rel be kind of relatively spread out over all the different frequencies so you don't get killed when you do the convolution. So anyway, at the end of the day, if this is true, kind of what you could say is like, yeah, you know, really, I do get something which looks like k plus n with this coherence, and then also this logarithmic factor. 
right? And that's, it's nice because it's kind of a new insight into an old problem, this problem of, uh, of blind deconvolution. Uh, and it's done, again, really using these tools of, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, compressed sensing. Okay, so really, like I sort of mentioned before, kind of the key technical issue is just how well, you know, the, something, this thing embeds these uh, 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 states of rank two matrices. Right, so it's, it's, you don't exactly, in this particular example, we didn't exactly do some kind of restricted isometry property, but it still boils down to, you know, applying this thing to rank two matrices and figuring out how, how the energy is preserved. Okay, great. So that's kind of just a, a very rough, high-level introduction to, uh, you know, this problem of low-rank recovery. Uh, it's, 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 very, it's sort of the tenor of the talk is very similar to when we talk about sparse recovery. And indeed, a lot of the mathematics, you know, happens in, in parallel. Uh, and it does have some other sort of exciting applications. You know, this idea of lifting up a set of bilinear equations, which I think they could have a, they could have a big impact in uh, signal processing communication. So I would invite you to, to look at these papers carefully and see what you can uh, learn from them. Okay, great. So let's break till, uh, uh, let's break till about uh, a little after 4, say 4.03, 10 minutes. And then we'll come back and I'll, you know, have the last lecture and I'll talk a little bit about, like, uh, dynamics. What happens when stuff is changing uh, and some, some work we're doing there. Okay, thank you.